Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Episode 249. Today we are remembering the great ufologist Stanton Friedman. And joining Wendy and I today is UFO enthusiast, my sister Allison, and the grand poobah of <laughs> ghost stories. And the what did Sam call you? The Queen of Fortiana? Her Majesty. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> All right. So join my sister Hi, Allison. Everybody. Join my- uh, also, we're joined by uh, investigative researcher, director of Illinois uh, MUFON, Sam Muranto. Sam, thanks for joining us again. A hey, pleasure to be on. And uh, also, we're joined by uh, a past guest, uh, somebody I've been reading his work and watching his lectures for now more than half of my life. And uh, that is best-selling author, UFO researcher, maestro of Roswell, Don Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Hi, Don. Hi, Sam. And, uh, Hi, Don. Hey, Don. And, and so uh, we just wanted to start out that, um, so if you're listening to this later or whatever, uh, Stanton Friedman died May 13th, 2019. He was 84. Uh, he passed away in Canada. Um, he, was born, he's a, he, was, he was a U.S. citizen. He was born in the United States, uh, in New Jersey, and he passed away in Canada uh, this past week. And so... Um, if you guys haven't heard of Stanton Friedman before, uh, he was, I mean, if you ever watch a UFO show, you, you would have seen him. Uh, he's a nuclear physicist. Uh, he was one of the OGs, the, you know, one of the original researchers into the UFO phenomena. And when I was doing research on him this week and just looking stuff up, I didn't realize that he was there from, um, not only the stuff like the, the the man that brought us Roswell, but I mean, he went back and he knew Betty and Barney Hill and had met them and done research on that famous abduction that kind of brought the idea of alien abduction into the mainstream. And uh, his loss was a massive loss uh, to the study of uh, unidentified flying objects, or what I think his favorite word was flying saucers. Yeah. I had forgotten that he had... He had done a film about the Betty and Barney Hill uh, incident with our friend Adam Gray from Canada. Uh, so we could put that in the show not- notes too. That He um, had also co-authored yeah. the book Captured with Kathleen uh, Martin, who is uh, the Hill's niece. Yes, and that film, that film with Adam Gray had, has him and Kathleen in it as well. Yes, so. yes. Uh, just, and has been an option for a motion picture. Oh, I did not know that. Yes. So the thing is, like, I only met Stanton like at in passing at a paranormal convention, and I know that Don, you had a, you know, you guys had done research or you had uh, a relationship uh, in ufology for years. And can you describe that a little bit of um, how, like, you guys might have met? Well, I would have met him initially. Now I went back. The first time I met Stan was 36 years ago. And it was at a conference, and there I was, fresh out of college, and this rookie, so to speak, who was often encouraged by my professors to seek out the best. Don't seek out your kind. Go to the masters. Go to the mentors who you then will model yourself after. So I was seeking out the JLN Hynek's the Stanton Friedmans. And I found Stan at that time to be not only totally responsive, totally open to exchanging ideas and conversing with someone who was just getting started in the field, but that he was willing to take me under his his wing, so to speak, in many ways. And we developed an ongoing relationship to the point that when he was then lecturing. He was doing a a lecture at Lake College, uh, north of Chicago, in the fall of 1988. And I was a skeptic on Roswell. And and Heineck had just passed away two years before. And I had worked with Heineck all those years leading up to his death. And I was a skeptic on Roswell. I just could not believe something of that magnitude could be kept a secret for all that time. 
So I'm backstage with Stan and I, I pose the question, um, you know, do you believe that you interviewed all the available witnesses? Do you believe you've taken Roswell as far as you can? And I was quite surprised when he responded, no, no, Don, no, no, I'm sure there are hundreds, hundreds of witnesses still out there. And I thought, well, well, fine, can I help in any way? And it wasn't like, no, we have it, you know, under, you know, lock and key, it's all ours. He went, no, no, please join us, do what you can. And the floodgates opened. And, and as I expected, uh, Stan was also very competitive. And at times he behaved and would and challenge me as though I was encroaching on his baby, his territory, so to speak. But it was always a very productive, healthy debate. It never got down to name calling or anything personal. It was always, we would always either disagree to uh, or agree to disagree or if we would appear on the same forum, forum I would say to him, okay, now Stan, let's present a united front. Let's only talk about that which we agree. And he was always the consummate professional when it came to that. He, he was, you know, man of his word. If we were be uh, interviewed on the same documentary, he would, okay, Don, let's only discuss that which we agree. And I can honestly say each and every time, and we shared the same forum dozens of times, he was a man of his word. He was he was honest to a T in that regard, and then that in itself, we became very good friends uh, for that fact alone. And, and so, um, you know, what do you think was uh, you know when when he came out and made his you know he said that he, about Roswell and he got into it, and then you were like, oh, I'm skeptical of it and everything. Um, how was he when? Uh, you know, because this is before Roswell, like the movie was made before there was a million different, uh, you know, Roswell documentaries and everything. And like the travel channel has a Roswell documentary, probably every other weekend. I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's one showing right now as we speak, probably. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't have someone walk up to me and say, I just saw you and I have no idea what they're talking about. (laughs) But we've lost track. We've lost track. You're absolutely correct. You're like, you're like, stop spying on me. I just saw you. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's, me, yeah. it's the camera I put in your shower. Um, <laughs> okay. But the thing is, like, so, you know, how when you first came up and, um, you know, what do you think was the thing that he said uh, where it kind of brought you from, I mean, obviously you're not a Roswell skeptic anymore after putting in decades of research and, and writing and, and all the times you've talked about it and, and things. And um, what do you think is what he said that kind of shifted your perspective from this is all hooey to, okay, there's something going on here. Well, and, and understandably, there was a level of professional jealousy because the book that he actually wrote to a high degree, and did most of the uh, uh, witness investigation to Roswell Incident, co-authored by William Moore and Charles Berlitz. And Stan only received an acknowledgement, Mm. and he should have received all the accolades for being the the true uh, inspirator, the true uh, spark plug as far as in getting this all started. And yet... It wasn't until Kevin Randall's, in my first book, UFO Crash of Roswell, came out, then 11 years later, that Roswell received all this acclamation, all this attention. And Stan felt, you know, in many ways, well, hey, wait a minute, I'm the one who started it. And so I understood that. And that's one of the reasons I still always bounced a lot of new material off of him. I would question him about, did you ever speak to so-and-so? What did they tell you? What do you think of this scenario? What do you think as far as plugging this new detail into the entire chronology, that type of thing? And to the point that when we were originally optioned to do the Roswell movie, Paul Davids, the executive producer, could honestly tell you that we even had a discussion at one point, should we bring Stan into the mix? Because, again, he was the true inspirator, the true inspiration. Paul Davids has been on the show too, and because he has his own interesting book, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, he has his own interesting book on how um, Forrest Ackerman from Famous Monsters of Filmland uh, has been visiting him from beyond the grave. Well, I, I knew Forrest. In fact, I'd been to Forrest's home 
on one occasion, which was like a Hollywood mausoleum down to the original dinosaurs from the original King Kong movie. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. What a glorious. And, and Forey Ackerman, just as a quick aside, and a number of others, he promised Paul Davis and a few other colleagues that as an, an Ackerman is an atheist. If there's anything on the other side, I'm going to make every effort to let you know, get back to you. And Paul Davis is one of these people that they have had these ongoing experiences that have confirmed, uh, convinced them that, yes, Forey made it. Forey Ackerman made it to the other side. And there is another side. So wonderful stories of Paul Davis in that regard. But on the same token, he had that same enthusiasm with the Roswell movie. And it wasn't like, well, let's see where it goes. It's like, my God, Don, if this is all true, it's one of the biggest stories of all time. And it was for the same uh, eyewitness testimony, uh, eyewitnesses describing the wreckage and the characteristics of this strange, bizarre material. The same witnesses and many more beyond what Stan had originally encountered. And that's where my slow evolution from a total skeptic to being 99% convinced. I then, from this doubting Thomas, who had confronted Stan Friedman about the availability of more material, more witnesses, and I found myself to then be paralleling his own investigation and then being competitors at times, but then always still coming together, presenting this united front that Roswell is the biggest story of the millennium. And we need to remain united in our presentation to the general public because it's the only way that the public is then going to pay attention. Because as long if we remain always in conflict and dissension, we're never going to get out of our own arena, so to speak. And as you mentioned at the beginning, Mike, that this has become a household word. And it's because of, of people specifically like Stanton Friedman, who have presented it on the public stage and have pounded into the public persona that Roswell happened, that it indeed was the crash of a craft of unknown origin. And Stan was the pioneer, and he was the one who spearheaded that front, and uh, he should forever receive that credit. Well, I certainly hope he does. Now, when we think about his effect, you know, his greater effect in the world of ufology, uh, I mean, the Roswell thing, like you said, like that book didn't come out, like the Charles Burlitt's book didn't come out until uh, maybe the early 1980s. 1980. Yeah. yeah, And and Charles Burlitt's had already, he's the man that gave us the Bermuda Triangle book uh, that kind of, you know, that kind of set that world on fire. Philadelphia Experiment also co-authored with Bill Moore. And so I feel like Charles Burlitz should probably get a co, you know, at least a story by credit in every science fiction film that's come out in the past 20 years. But as far as, uh, as far as Stan Friedman's, uh, you know, effect on the greater world of ufology. So Sam, how do you feel that maybe, um, what, what kind of influence do you think he had on the research and the kind of stuff that you do and the guys at MUFON do? Well, the thing is, he was the most, uh, I would say, and Don would probably agree, the most iconic figure in ufology, uh, at least in the United States, I would say. Uh, uh, Don, would you pretty much agree with that? Yes, I would, totally. And here he is in on television, uh, in the news. And the funny thing about the man, he was willing to go uh, nose to nose with the, uh, what did he refer to him as, the noisy uh, uh nasty, noisy negativists, which would be the uh, pseudo skeptics. And uh, and then, of course, the, the genuine skeptic and anybody who's coming into this with a degree of uh, objectivity is, of course, going to have some degree of skepticism. That's fine. Again, you know, science isn't a, about uh, consensus. It's about debate and evidence uh, being taken forward and laid out. And that's something that that Stanton did. Stanton brought orthodoxy and uh, academia to the forefront of ufology. It, he gave it uh, a degree of uh, credence that, that few of us were able to bring forward. Like I, I, I could say if anybody finds acronyms in the back of my name, they're typos. So this man had credentials. He had the spirit. And he went through the front door. In other words, he went through the proper channels to establish 
the information that he brought forward and, and confronted individuals with, the very information they requested, he delivered, and few were able to do that. Don, I, I applaud you. You did the same thing. But he was front and center on all of this. He was at the tip of the arrow. And when you're at the tip of the arrow, you take the blunt uh, of most of, of the uh, negative garbage that's going to be thrown at you, and you're not going to get your kudos. Uh, the man throughout his life, that at least for the period of time that I know him, he was always a gentleman, even to those people he engaged in as far as discussion or argument. And that's something few people manage to, to hold on to. Uh, is is the degree of civility, and that's something that we need more of in the field. The other thing is, like Don was saying, we need to work united on things and and find our common ground, not the dividing factors and the things that that are that divide us up so much. I remember being at a conference once, and um, uh, Scott Ramsey was with me, and two uh, other researchers were having a bad fight. They were just fighting really bad. It was just embarrassing. And he says, the biggest problem in ufology is no threat by any outside forces. It's really the people inside. And it's so true. And we need to bow to a better degree of civility and also work united if we're ever going to move ahead. And I think Stan in many ways did show that though he never backed down if he maintained a posture on something. Well said, well said, Sam. Now, where we're heading as far as, you know, what he's done and what we're actually going to be doing down the road and hopefully uh, his influence, I think there's a void and we need to fill that void um, and we need to fill it soon. We need to have people that could, that could manage and, and ha- hold themselves in the uh, in the media in the position that he held, which was in a high position in the eye of the public, we need to have that. I think we also need someone who can who's got that well trimmed beard like Sam had that that thin <laughs> around the side. Now, Al- Al- Allison, what were you going to say? Well, um, yes, Stanton did have a well trimmed beard, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I I wanted to jump in there because Sam was talking about Stanton's credentials, you know, as a nuclear physicist, and you know all the the um, higher work that he did do. And then uh, just recently on um, Stanton's site, he blogged about Bob Lazar and how Bob Lazar, uh, who is, a, of course, a big um, name in the UFO field and had just been profiled again in uh, Jeremy Corbell's uh, film that uh, recently came out this uh, fall, I believe it was. And um, he was... Stanton was very, uh, I shouldn't say skeptical because he, he just laid it on the line that here is Bob Lazar saying that he has these advanced degrees and making extraordinary claims about his credentials. And yet when nobody is able to substantiate those claims saying, well, the government just wiped the records and Stanton came forward and said, no, that is bunk. You know, he is some, you know, Stanton was someone who had advanced degrees and he knew, you know, what, what it took to get there. And he was calling Bob Lazar out on that. And I think that's really important because in this world of ufology, we find ourselves often up against disinformation campaigns and, Perhaps that's what's going on with um, Bob Lazar and all his claims throughout the years. I'm not sure about that. But Stanton would call it like he saw it, even though it was it was um, incredibly unpopular to do so uh, and probably always has been to stand up for what you feel is correct based on your research, even if the crowd is going a different way. And that is just... One more example, the most recent example of Stanton doing that. And to be critical just for a moment, then to put the shoe on the other foot, where Stan would defend something that remains just as controversial now after 30, 32 years, that would be the MJ-12 documents. Right. That, 
as much doubt and deference to the authenticity of those documents stand in like uh, manner that one would defend Bob Lazar, here was Stan defending something just as controversial. That's true. And yet he expected people to at least provide him with a forum, provide him with an opportunity to make his case. And one, one could say the same for Bob Lazar, that just because one remains skeptical doesn't mean that all the answers are forthcoming. That just because someone cannot demonstrate their bona fides, so to speak, you can't say that, well, there's a cover-up, but only if I specify where the cover-up lays. Um, You can't specify that all documentation is available, but then if your documents aren't available, that means they don't exist. We can't have it both ways. And I that's think that's absolutely true. That the thing is, Times had to be careful that he wasn't yeah. being overly territorial. That, almost despotic. Yeah. You know, real quick before you jump in, I know you're going to jump in here, Sam, but real quick, I, I want to say, in Stan and Freeman talking about Bob Lazar, he does still end in a nice thing. He goes, I should add that Bob is a bright and talented guy who operated a jet powered car put on a fireworks display, and apparently helped physics professors working at the Los Alamos Misan uh, Accelerator Facility. So even though on his on his thing where he comes out and it's like, hey, man, I don't buy any of what Bob Lazar is saying. I don't believe in that he went to MIT kind of thing or Caltech. He does say, I think Bob's a cool guy. Uh, so even though he critiques him, um, he does come back at the end and say like, hey, you know, I think he's all right. I think he's a bright guy. I think he's talented. Uh, I just don't believe him about the different uh, degrees. And so I think that kind of conversation where you can be like, uh, hey, I, um, I I don't necessarily believe you here, but I can see that you're still a human being and you're a cool guy is, is important to the conversation uh, so that we can have conversations and not- In an ongoing conversation that it, it doesn't close- Doors. It doesn't burn bridges. It was a. It was a, the very comment that I made uh, to a reporter just the other day. The idea that the, Stan and I at times could practically, you know, be at each other's throats regarding not personal things but issues, details, witnesses, that type of thing. But then when we were finished, we were shaking hands and we walked away, still respected friends. That we could again assume the same roles the very next day. And, and pick up where we left off. And that's the progress, the advancement. And as and Sam is absolutely correct that so much of the infighting is what is destroying, which is where you can just imagine the powers that be in Washington just sitting back and going, there they are, just fighting like cats and dogs between themselves. And we don't have to ever worry about them because they're going to destroy themselves. And I'm sorry, I'm not one. I've never said, you know, count me in. I want to participate. No, it's uh, it's an end game philosophy, and I choose not to, to play the game. And that's true. I mean, the, the, between the infighting and the and the new black, which is noise, there's so much noise out there uh, today. When you, you most people coming into the interest of ufology or be thinking they are ufologists have done so because they just watch a n- x number of YouTube uh, presentations or possibly write a few books instead of actually going out there doing some research, uh, getting some formal training, and, and that's a problem. But one thing, getting back to, to uh, the orthodoxy and, and the, uh, at the importance of academia, these credentials, this is how the world sees us and legitimizes things. In other words, if two people are saying the same thing, it's the person with the credentials that is going to be acknowledged for making that statement. This has happened time and time again. And what I found interesting in a conversation with Ted Phillips and Stanton sitting there, we were having a talk. Stanton asked him, was was asking him again what his credentials were and what he had done. And, and I'm like, he's known these guys for years. And, and uh, Ted Phillips stopped and he said, you know what, Stan? I learned more in driving a race car and playing drums when it comes to dealing with people and having some idea what some element of truth is in their their uh, statements. And, and, you know, I just sat there and he just went back and he says, you know, and he listened to it. Maybe there's some sense in that. The bottom line is like with with uh, 
the whole scenario with Lazard. You don't know what we don't know. The man could have done a number of things that are so high level that there wouldn't be records on it at all. I have no idea. But to exhaust ourselves and to put ourselves in the posturing of trying or looking like we're beating on somebody, that isn't advantageous at all. That turns the tide and it isn't good. So we want to maintain a posture of saying, well, we don't know what we don't know. And let's pursue what we do know, or at least what we think we may know. And that's pursue evidence. So, Wendy, do you think um, you've you've learned anything after playing drums all these years? <laughs> well, I have to say that did resonate a bit with me, but I'm bummed. <laughs> you, you know, I really like, uh, though, you know, what you guys are saying, um, the idea that we can have disagreements with each other, but then presenting the United Front. And I think that's, I think about this with uh, my toddler because, you know, you, you, oh, you guys always have to have, uh, you know, when you're, when you're talking to her, um, you know, mom can't say something different than dad. And otherwise it's going to confuse and she's going to use it against you and then uh, like burn the house down. But the thing is, is that when we're presenting the best arguments we can to the normals out there, the more infighting we do in front of them, uh, the less convinced people are going to be, or the more they're going to be like, well, this is just, you know, uh, they're going to think of this as we're a bunch of drama queens or whatever, and not serious in the in the research and serious in trying to find out the truth of things. The main problem with ufology is that everyone is free to believe, accept, uh, pursue whatever you know, preconceived theory, notion they have on the subject. There are certainly far from any absolutes. And anyone who's ever introduced or promoted as an expert on UFOs, there's no such thing. There are no answers in that regard. So how can you be an expert on it? You can be an expert on the cases, an expert on the history, the personalities, that type of thing. But that's as far as it goes. But in this being, I mean, still presently being an unaccepted science, so to speak, that in that stand brought a scientific methodology into this undisciplined field, just as Heineck did, just as Dr. Richard Haynes, Dr. David Jacobs, Dr. Bruce Mack could be on and on and on. They became the, the pioneers, the leaders. They, they then took us into areas of pursuit that we were able to develop these hardcore cases, these go-to cases that we could always cite whenever we confronted the skeptics. And Stan, as, and Sam very aptly describes how Stan did not back down to anyone. In fact, even last year, Stan was talking with us. He was to have uh, done a debate with uh, skeptic Michael Shermer. Oh, yeah. And he was talking personally to Travis Walt and myself because in, in Stan's failing health, he wasn't sure he was up to it. So we provided him with some new ammunition. We provided him with some new areas that, that he could go to if he needed to hit below the belt, so to speak. But it was only in Stan's more delicate uh, situation that he even needed to go below the belt, so to speak that he could always rely on his own knowledge of the subject, his own expertise. And he always came out on top. I don't care if it was Michael Shermer or Seth Schalchak or uh, Philip J. Class or Robert Schaefer and uh, you know James McGaha, on and on and on. Whoever Stan debated, he always dominated because nobody knew the subject better than Stan Friedman. And that is where whenever the media or any one of us working with Stan, whenever you needed to go to the well, whenever you needed to go to the encyclopedia, you went to Stan Friedman. Well, I, I think that's a, um, I mean, that's, that's an awesome, uh, an awesome way to remember. Everybody would love to be remembered as the person as uh, when people were looking, are looking for a rock. You know, when people are looking for something solid, um, that you can be remembered as, as the person uh, that you come to. And I think about as far as my favorite memories of Stanton Friedman come from him debating Philip Class 
on like Larry King and stuff like that. Because you know, Philip Class is and so if you guys look him up on YouTube if you haven't if you if you don't remember like uh, watching in the seventies and eighties, there's always this UFO skeptic that comes on and he's just the Debbie Downer of ufology when he would just come in and you'd be like, Oh man, he's just gonna, you know, say people are crazy or say it's a cloud or something. It's always gonna be the same thing. And I always thought that Stanton always came out when he talked against um when they would debate each other that he always came out uh looking like not crazy because philip class would he would always find ways to like manipulate the conversation into you know uh making the uh the person on the ufo side uh the pro ufo side look a little nuts and Stanton always came out looking looking great philip uh, philip j class was uh, the the resident skeptic at what formerly was called PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. And it was founded by Carl Sagan, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov. So class was uh, in, in very high company. Mm -hmm. And yet one of the best confrontations I ever saw Stan have with class was on NBC, or excuse me, on ABC Nightline. And Stan just ripped him to shreds that particular night. And I called him up the very next day, and I told him so, because he was in his element. He just did not allow class to speak over him, get a last word in, and he just kept bombarding him with facts. Isn't it true, Phil, this? Isn't it true, Phil, that? And class never had a response except... Well, that's nonsense. Or certainly they would have done this or they should have done that, which was classic skeptical response because they, I can't shoehorn this case into this round pigeonhole the way I'd like to, then it's a hoax, that type of thing. And it took a, a, a Stanton Friedman to recognize their tactics for what they were. And they were tactics, and they were more often smear tactics to destroy the messenger, destroy the witnesses, and then walk home knowing, well, I just destroyed the truth once and for all, once again, and the people are always going to believe the bigger lie. If you tell, tell a lie enough times, people are going to believe it. And then again, that uh, sadly is their M.O., in, in UFO research. So do you guys have a particular, uh, you know, favorite memory of the man? Like when I'm thinking about it, like watching his presentation at the Michigan Paranormal Conference and having it just be very like a straight up college lecture. Um, I, I was sitting there and I remember thinking like, this is one of my favorite lectures today. First of all, because I get to see this guy I've been watching and reading uh, my entire life live. Second, it's because this is the kind of college lecture I wish I would have had. <laughs> you know, you're sitting there like, I'm like, oh man, you know, he's got the, um, it starts, it's, it's like straight up UFOs, 101, uh, nuts and bolts, extraterrestrial hypothesis, like right into it, uh, delivered, like he's probably delivered it uh, hundreds of times before, um, but delivered in that, in, in a way of, this is the straight up classic version of the UFO flying saucer story. And, uh, you know, my favorite memory is just sitting there going, of the man is just sitting there thinking, uh, boy, um, I would have done better in college if it was like this. <laughs> I have to agree, actually. I, I just wanted to chime in and say that I, the first time that I saw Stanton at a paranormal conference, just seeing him sitting there at the booth, I had a little fangirl moment because, you know, <laughs> I myself have a degree in mechanical engineering and respect so much the work that he's done. And just to see somebody like that with the integrity and the willingness to come forward and present at such a, you know, maybe controversial type of <laughs> event for most people in that field, um, it really geeked me out. <laughs> and then to see his lecture was also really, like Mike said, it was a... Uh, pretty awesome. So I'm glad that I had that experience. I I'm glad I was able to see him present. The time I had with uh, Ted Phillips and him sitting there, and we we're just just talking and to, uh, to sit with two icons, one being physical traced evidence expert. You know, he's worked on how many cases Don has uh, Ted work on? 160. Uh, well, actually, cases, uh, physical trace cases that he cataloged over 3,000. 3,000, mind you. 
But, and I asked him one day, I go, what do you do with the evidence stuff? My wife's ready to throw, the, throw me and that stuff out of the house. <laughs> but, but to have him, the two of them bounce off each other, one guy, you know, on hands knowledge. And, he, and, he, and you know, he has a, a experience working in, in the, uh, uh, in, it was the Air Force, I believe, missile, guided missiles he worked on. So he had a lot of, and he was learning, to, uh, Stan was learning a lot of things that he never knew about. And it's just in a, sitting down and talking, I don't know if we were having pizza or what it was, but just to hear them talk coming from different different worlds. And we all do. This is the strange thing about it. We all live in different worlds. We all have different kens, our different point of reference, our different way of analyzing things and looking at the world. And it's so hard for us to understand. So when you come into the world of looking at something so truly unusual as the phenomena of UFOs, and you try to put that into any context of how do we go researching it? How do we banter amongst each other and and cross-reference things, and boy, it gets complicated. And I think Stanton, because he had this rigid academic background, uh, it he helped put things into a context. And I was happy to be able to call him up and bounce off of him. So every moment I talked with the man, it was a great time. We always had a great time. And I am enviable of Don because he had so many great moments together with him, far more than I could even ever imagine. Uh, many a time just driving late night, four o'clock in the morning, and just um, keeping each other awake, telling some of the most fantastic UFO stories we had ever heard, and being in parades together, and traveling overseas together, England, uh, South America, Brazil, that type of thing, Mexico, uh, all the festivals at Roswell. Stan and I were the two advisors to the board of directors at the museum. So uh, I, at, at last I heard, they're not even going to fill uh, his position. It'll just it'll just remain myself. But uh, Sam and I we were talking earlier when we did the Peter Jennings primetime special on UFOs back in two thousand and five. And uh, Stan and I had spent four days in the field filming with ABC for this special. And the week before its premiere, they contacted both of us that they weren't going to be able to use anything that they had shot. And they wanted to know if we could provide whatever B-roll, whatever other material we had from other interviews for their, their quick usage. And if you were to go back, that material was all CBS and NBC. It was all old, raw footage, but it wasn't what they shot because they weren't able to use it. And we would learn afterwards from someone at ABC that someone else on high told them they were not to use what they had filmed. Whoa. In other words, Stan and I had provided them. What we had openly discussed with them, when we took them out to the crash site and we had witnesses who could describe, now this is where we saw this and this is the extent of the debris and how large the debris field and, and everything was, they were not to use that. And then to listen to Peter Jennings introduce that segment on Roswell and in the first minute use the word myth five times we could see again what the, what the game plan was. Uh, a quick, a quick uh, a humorous uh, situation was with, with Stan in, in Amsterdam, and he was getting ready. He was closing up. Uh, as when he was talking about watching him even work his, uh, his book table, his autograph table, that type of thing. And he was just closing up, and, and a lady had uh, given him uh, a tray of, of, of brownies, for him to snack on the way back to Canada. <laughs> and oh boy. he was just packing everything up. And all at once, some lady yells out, Mr. Friedman, you're not going to take those with you, are you? And he goes, well, yes. You know, it, it, it'd be a good snack on the way home. And he goes, well, I, I wouldn't touch them, Mr. Friedman, because they're full of marijuana. <laughs> and, and, and Stan... As that 
look of just total, you know, bewilderment. And he goes, you're kidding. <laughs> and then he, he, he then he, he's staring, you know, down at the ground. And he goes, my God, would have been hell getting through customs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that good one. <laughs> so his, his, his total innocence and naivety, and yet it was just priceless. It was priceless. It was just wonderful. Memories I'll never, I'll never forget. And what was it they referred to them, they referred to him as a UFO um, promoter instead of a nuclear physicist? Wasn't that in an NBC? I, I, on the Peter Jennings, yeah, yeah, that we were UFO promoters, right? In it for the money, in it for the books, yeah. Right, yeah. of course. Crazy. That's of course not you guys have made the big time. Obviously, when you're on CU on the other side, that you're just in it for the money. Every politician, every news reporter, every journalist, they can write every book, every article, every opportunity, every lecture they want. But heaven help a ufologist for trying to fund their own research. My God, you know, you're you're opportunist. You have you're disqualified. You no longer are legitimate. Uh, these people are so phony. They're so such hypocrites that again, that was the great thing about Stan. He didn't give these people the time of day. He taught me that even more than Heineck did. Don't even give them a second thought. I think him him and Heineck had there was a lot of parallels. The way they had, they were given abuse and and dissed, even though they had all these credentials. Heineck was dissed left and right, pretty much the same way Stan was. You know, he was a a um, a very well renowned uh, uh, astronomer until he got into UFOs. I hear this time and time again from uh, one of our friends down there, and I say that um, tongue in cheek over at the Adler. Uh, you know, I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean this okay. this. Is, yeah, you hear this time and time again. And uh, the same thing with Stanton here. You don't even they don't even give him uh, any any credence for, for what he what he's done. It <laughs> recognizes his the fact that he's a nuclear physicist. My gosh. You know? Science still needs the funding. There are no breakthroughs without the government grants, without sure. the sponsors. Nobody. I mean, I'm sorry. The, the, the reason, if you go back to Carl Sagan's original writings on UFOs back in the late 60s, they were very pro-UFO. And you know how they got Sagan to march as far as to their drum? By funding him. By oh, yeah. essentially tying him up with special grants, with special funding, and that's the best way to get you to cooperate and play with their ball with, uh, as far as on their field. And to the credit of the Stan Friedmans and the Jalen Hynix, they never sold their souls. They never went to where was waving the bigger carrot. And, I mean, science is essentially where the money has taken them. It's the reason that the NASA effort is has become practically non-extent. I mean, we haven't been to the moon in 50 years or so they would have us believe. But it's because, again, publicly the funding isn't there. And the reason we haven't had the major breakthroughs in ufology, at least on the forefront, is because, again, the funding, the official funding is not there. And it's not our fault. That's not our fault. That's a big point. Um, Rodiger and myself, I think it was uh, Swords, we were all talking about I, me being you know, new on the block. I says, well, what's it going to take for us to become recognized as science? And the reply that I got wasn't a plan of action. It was a number, and it was a big number. Um, the bottom line, it's going to take many, 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 many millions, tens of millions of dollars to move this thing forward. And uh, why? Well, let's go rob a bank. You know, uh, go fund me. <laughs> yeah. It's, and a lot of it, and I think you would agree, Sam, a lot of it would be just hiring a major law firm to go after the federal government and, and, and essentially disclosure of all the documents, all the uh, special reports, the studies that were done on UFOs that we never even heard of. We talk, we always reference Project Blue Book, you know, the TV series now on the History Channel and Heineck, you know, portrayed as it's like an action hero. 
as an action hero. <laughs> yeah. None of it is even close to reality. Believe me, Heineken was not even involved in the field. He didn't do in the field investigations. That's another, we could do another whole episode on that. But the point being, that was just Air Force. What about the Navy? What about the Army, which Roswell fell under? What about the Marine Corps? They had, they also had their own respective investigations. So a lot of the funding would go into just suing the government for disclosure. We think they're just going to roll over and volunteer it now after 72 years when I think it would be money well spent that we would have attorneys just go for broke. And it's just, you know, we're calling for uh, public hearings. We're going we're going to call for congressional hearings on the subject. And we're not going to walk away until we have full disclosure. Well, I'm going to try to convince my wife to get to do that. Like if, uh, her and all her lawyer friends, if we can get them on our UFO side, we might have something. Allison, you uh, you had your hand raised. What, what were you going to say? <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, regarding funding, I mean, I think that is, you know, something that uh, is, is an issue. And I was really um, – I thought it was remarkable that Don uh, brought up Carl Sagan because I was shocked when I uh, read Frank Edwards' 1966 book, um, UFOs, Serious Business. And he talked about, yeah, yeah, Flying Saucers, yes, Flying Saucers, Serious Business um, from 1966. Yeah, and he talks about Carl Sagan in there. As if Carl Sagan is a proponent of ufology. And I'm like, at whoa, time, wait a minute. At the time he was. At I the know. Time he was. Yes. And so that was really startling to me. So that was a deep cut that you brought out, Don. I was really excited to, <laughs> to hear you say that. Um, and and I just wanted to share about Stanton. I mean, to me, to me, he was always somebody who would take whatever position was supported by his research, no matter what. I mean, that's what I will always remember about Stanton, you know, how he was steadfast. And we need to see more of that in ufology and in the paranormal field in general to elevate us to where we need to be, that people will come out and they will, they will not mince words, you know, be nice about it, but tell the truth based on what you know, based on your research and just put it out there, no matter how unpopular, more people have to have the guts to do that like Stanton Friedman did. Yep. Excellent point, Allison. And the point is, it it did take guts. It, it, it did take courage. And that Stan was able to turn right around within his own ranks and turn it back on the scientific community. Why? What will it take for you people to, 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 to take note? What will it take for you people to get involved? What more evidence? And as we have often, and, and, and Sam and I have often, you know, challenged the, uh, the the skeptics, the evidence is there for anyone who is brave enough, willing to look at it, examine it. And, and Stan would constantly, you know, tout this evidence. He would st- constantly, you know, present as far as his lectures on flying saucers are real. That was the very you know, title of his talk for many years. It wasn't, well, I'm going to try to prove they're real or I'm going to try to demonstrate that there's a real phenomenon. No, it was just that definitive. They are real. End of debate, end of argument. Yeah, and And let's move on to the next step is what he was saying. That that took a tremendous amount of fortitude and, and, and courage to just make that pronouncement, and Stan Friedman was the first one to do it. Well, you know, and um, he was there, I, you know, when I called him in the beginning, I killed like a, a UFO G, uh, you know, on a unidentified flying original gangster. Because, um, you know, when we were talking earlier, the fact that he was involved in those, you know, initial stuff, like right from the 1960s, uh, he, he gets in there and is doing the research and abduction. And then in the 1970s, he's out there, at doing lectures, the UFOs are real movie, uh, which I think I saw like secondhand or something like that. Like somebody's copied VHS tape that I borrowed. That was uh, 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 Michael quickly. That was 1978, and I remember that because I had just started working with Heineck at the time, 
And there was quite a, there was a, a tremendous amount of excitement because that was originally intended to be a feature film, you know, released throughout theaters throughout right. the United States. And at the time, it was the highest budgeted documentary ever produced. Three quarters of a million dollars to produce that film. Oh, wow. And, and somebody, once again, put the thumbs down to it. Because it wasn't wow. until it came out on video that it was even released. Yeah, because because that that's the kind of thing. Like, of course, you would try to take advantage of the fact that like Close Encounters of the Third Kind and things. So if you can follow up a uh, you know follow up a very successful fiction film with a here's a nonfiction look at the same kind of thing you just saw Steven Spielberg do. You know, right? You've got everyone's attention, so <laughs> right. So let's go with it. And the fact that it wouldn't get released in the theaters where that would be something that would be a slam dunk to make money um, is, is very questionable. Uh, well, that's, I mean, the CIA Hollywood connection. Um, we've talked about that before with, uh, you know, Robbie Graham's great book on silver screen saucers and how, how the CIA in their partnership with the, the uh, movie studios and different producers in Hollywood has kind of led uh, and developed uh, the mythos of, of UFOs over the years. Wendy, what, what are you going to say? Well, I just wanted to follow up on kind of what Don was saying about the fact that he had the integrity to stand up and insist UFOs are real. You'd think that in this day and age, it wouldn't be so difficult to to stand up and, and propose something that's out of the normal expectation, you know, of society and everything. But it it really makes me think of back when people thought the earth was flat, you know, <laughs> and somebody like Galileo standing up and saying, no, <laughs> what I'm, what I'm finding much to my dismay though, mm -hmm. more and more with the current crop of journalists in as, in, in as such as that they like to yeah. banter the word conspiracy around more and more. And, and, and Stan didn't like that word. I don't like that word. I don't believe uh, Sam cares for that word because no. we're talking about, you know, a group of people conspiring to right. essentially perpetrate, a, you know, criminal activity. Whereas a cover up is in a response to an incident, an event. UFOs came first. The fact that by whatever manner we have responded to it, either by a public disclosure, we announce it to the world or we contain it. We cordon it off. We cover it up. Big difference. And we can easily demonstrate that UFOs have been covered up. It's not a conspiracy. And yet they constantly mm. try to label us conspiracy buffs. I saw mm. just a journalist the other day again talking about the whole conspiracy going on in Washington, you know, whether, you know, what, no matter what your politics, and then he makes the comment, you know, you know, you know, tan them out to, you know, the Roswell conspiracy as a pejorative, you know, as a negative. And then Reader's Digest just came out with the 10 biggest conspiracies of all time. And guess what one of them happens to be once again, but Roswell. So it's like, do your homework. You people, again, are demonstrating the fact that you don't even know history. You don't even know the definition of the very word. And these are the things that Stan was always quick to pounce on, to educate these people. And again, with his credentials, with his background, with his, his store off as far as uh, attitude, as far as that I'm leading the charge here and either you follow me or you fall behind. But he was, you know, a leader in all respects. And Sam is absolutely correct that it's going to be a void that's going to be very difficult to fill. Um, you know, I, I love that that you're talking about. It makes me think about uh, like microaggressions against UFO people. You know, when, when, when you see something in there, like, oh, that's just like the Roswell conspiracy or whatever. Um, you know, that, that, those are my trigger words. Uh, when I hear that, I'm like, what? It's not a conspiracy. I'm a puncher. <laughs> um, so th that's the kind of thing. But, you know, hopefully um, – we will get more researchers like Stanton Friedman, who gave us uh, decades of great research, entertainment, as well as a uh, excellent model with which to follow in how we look at unexplained phenomena and uh, and how we explain it to other people. Um, 
I think is a, uh, you know, he's just a great role model to set. And I want to thank you guys very much for joining us in our conversation today. I could listen to you guys uh, talk about when you're, you know, like throwing out UFA, UFO cases back and forth, uh, like people talk about oh my baseball gosh. players. Um, I could do that. I could listen to that stuff all day. But I was going to say, I think the story with uh, Don and, and Stanton driving late at night and sharing stories. You guys could have been in a band together. <laughs> yeah. A, you, um, it could have it, Right. No, the Don and Stanton band. I go see that band. Um, <laughs> totally. But Mike, as you said, as far as almost like baseball players and, and like the classic line in baseball, for love of the game. And that's what they're True. saying for, for Sam and I. And, mm-hmm. and again, you know, Stan was the coach. He was the manager. He was the captain. That's right. And he's the one who taught us for love yep. of the game. And, uh, you know, if, if people want to see you guys upcoming at any events um, now, Don, before you were talking about this is going to be the uh, the latest Roswell Festival is coming in a few weeks. Can you talk about that real quick for people who might be interested in, in checking it out? It's our annual festival commemorating uh, the 1947 incident. This will be the 72nd anniversary. And uh, where Stan would normally have been, you know, a regular featured, uh, you know, participant in that, uh, we will carry on. Uh, we will have certainly a tribute ceremony and uh, other, uh, uh, you know, things as far as in his memory. But uh, our latest uh, book coming out on uh, entitled UFO Secrets Inside Wright Patterson. Uh, Stan wrote the foreword and uh, the book is dedicated uh, to Stan. And uh, the book will be uh, just uh, in, released in uh, bookstores and at Amazon uh, end of next month, end of June. Fantastic. And we'll have links to the uh, the books and the fair and the festival and stuff like that in Roswell, all in the show notes, othersidepodcast.com slash 249. You'll be able to check that out, uh, see pictures of our esteemed colleagues here, and then you'll be able to click on the link and uh, check out Don's new book with Stanton's introduction uh, also, and see if, if you want to go visit Roswell for the festival this year. Wendy? And I just wanted to uh, extend condolences to the family and friends of Stanton, um, including Donald and Sam here. And Thank Allison, you. Uh, you. yeah, sorry for your loss. It's it, that was a big one. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And uh, Sam, uh, anything, if people uh, want to come check out your speaking or any engagements that you're working on soon? I'll be speaking in Philly. I, doggone, I forget the dates in, in June sometime. Uh, but uh, Jim Pennison, a few other folks at the Philadelphia MUFON uh, conference, and I'll be talking about the uh, Tinley Park and O'Hare and some other revelations that came out of these uh, mass sighting cases. The other thing I want to bring up is the fact that, of course, Don's going to join us September the 21st down at the Rock, Star of Rock, for a Heineck Unplugged. How do you like that title, Don? <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yes. And uh, as Ellison knows, we always have a great time down there. It's a very unique place. Yeah, it's a one of a kind location. resort and the wilderness around there. Oh, do we have a good time or what? Absolutely. <laughs> also, Starved, Starved Rock has like an amazing history of why it's called Starved Rock. And yes. uh, we'll, have, we'll have to talk about that in an episode sometime. Sure. Allison, uh, when's the next time people can see you speak or do some of your talking thing? Oh, well, we've got a lot coming up in June, you and me both. And then, uh, of course, uh, Hawaii Paracon is coming up in July. So after you go in uh, the beginning of July to Roswell, New Mexico, at the end of July, July 19th through 21st, you have to join uh, me in uh, Hawaii in on the island of Oahu and you can find more information about all the spectacular events and speakers planned at hawaiiparacon.com all right awesome thank you very much for joining us today guys uh thanks once again to stan friedman and his wonderful work uh, decades of inspiration uh to people who are seeking the truth in the skies just like us thank you for the opportunity thank you thank you so much One phrase that we struck on in this podcast was UFOG, the Unidentified Flying Original Gangsta. Stanton Friedman was one of the earliest scientists who took the UFO phenomena seriously back when it wasn't cool to be on the side of the extraterrestrial hypothesis. He debated the debunkers in worldwide forums long before the History Channel or Tom DeLonge made flying saucers culturally hip. He listened to and validated the experiences of abductees before the rest of the community took them seriously. 
His bravery in taking the plunge is an inspiration to every one of us who seeks the truth, and this song is dedicated to him. Here's Sunspot with UFO G's. Someone had to light the candle, someone had to fire the torch, someone had to lead the way. Someone had to forge on forward, someone had to stay the course, someone had to be brave. Oh, hey, hey, these UFOGs weren't afraid to take the blame. Your heart is on the floor You can stand your ground On the shoulders of the ones Who came before Threats and misinformation Cover-ups and lies We have to stay unafraid We look to them for inspiration To keep us for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. After a great conversation like that, I want to continue discussing these topics with people. And you know where the perfect place to do that is, Wendy? I do, actually, Mike. It's at the See You on the Other Side monthly Patreon hangout. Oh, that's right. That's where we can keep the conversation flowing. Yeah, I actually didn't want to end that conversation. There was so much great discussion going on. And uh, I'm looking forward to continuing talking about UFOs and great researchers like Stanton Friedman. And we can do that when? Uh, May 28th, Tuesday. May 28th is the day we're going to do it. 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Oh, yeah. And we do it through Skype. So keep an eye on your Patreon notifications or check in the private See You on the Other Side Facebook group if you're one of our members. If you're not one of our members... Well, we'd love to have you join us. It's very easy to be one of our members. In fact, <laughs> it it's is. so easy, you're going to hit yourself and you're like, I should have done this years ago. And you can do it, right? It's uh, othersidepodcast.com slash donate. Othersidepodcast.com slash donate is where you can join in on the Patreon fun. And we appreciate our Patreons very much. Dr. Ned is at the level where he gets a shout out every single episode. So hey, Dr. Ned. Dr. Ned, thank you for your support. It is 100% appreciated. And we love giving you guys um, fun conversations uh, like today's Remembrance of Stanton Friedman with people that have met and worked with him. Um, so it's not just us reading uh, like the Wikipedia page. It's you know <laughs> us getting first person accounts of people that cared for the man, and uh, that's the kind of stuff we love to talk about. Not I mean not just necrologs and people's deaths, but we like getting to the heart of the matter and talking to the real people who were involved in situations. And so in order to be able to do that, we got to have the time and the and the and the funding. And so you guys with the Patreon are really helping us do that every week. So thank you so much. It means more than you know. 
truly, thank you. We appreciate you. So we're going to appreciate you live uh, Tuesday, May 28th at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. So keep your eye out for those invites uh, in the Patreon group. And for anybody else who wants to join, please join us at othersidepodcast.com slash donate. He was one of the OGs, the, you know, one of the original researchers into the UFO phenomena. He was there, I, you know, when I called him in the beginning, I killed like a, a UFO G. Uh, you know, on a unidentified flying original gangster.